today we'll be uh, starting with a new paper, uh, a paper on modern India, and the period is uh, 1750 to 1950. And uh, this is uh, our introduction to modern Indian history. We will deal with the concepts, uh, terminologies, and various approaches to the study of modern Indian history. We propose to divide our whole discussion into five parts. Uh, the first part is the introductory part, uh, followed by periodization, then uh, terminologies, then uh, our modernity, and then our observations. When we talk about modern India, we generally uh, have in our mind the period which embraced late 18th, 19th, and of course, uh, the 20th century. Now, incidentally, this was the period when uh, there was the advent and consolidation of colonial rule. Not just British, but different European powers were there. Anyway, India was colonized by Britain. And British colonial rule brought with it uh, many things. It brought with it a new education, Western education, yeah. Western science, Western technology, uh, Western thoughts, different thoughts. And uh, probably the most important part is it also brought with, along with it, the system of industrial capitalism, a new socio-economic system, uh, which was, which had its uh, birth not in India, but in uh, capitalist Britain. And the result was that uh, our concepts of modern India, our concept of modernity, uh, got very much intertwined with uh, those ideas which we borrowed from the West. Very much intertwined. Uh, this is not to suggest that uh, the response was, the response of the Indian people was the same everywhere. There might have been differences in approach, in response. But there was no approach which could wish away the reality of colonial rule. So colonial rule had to be taken into consideration because that became the major fact of life after the introduction, after its introduction. And the result was that there was a definite Eurocentric bias in our approach to modernity, in our approach to modern India. Now, we are talking about modern India. Uh, when we talk about modern India, it also implies that uh, there were something like ancient India, something like medieval India, which preceded modern India. So these form part of periodization. Now, the important question is, what is the basis of this periodization? Now, there was a time when uh, historians, uh, they uh, made this division on the basis of religion, unconsciously or consciously. I'm not saying that it was a conscious effort, but consciously or unconsciously, the basis was religion. And of course, it was, a, it was an unscientific approach, no doubt about it. So ancient India, in our, in our history, in our case, became identified with, uh, with the period when Hindu rulers, quote-unquote Hindu rulers, ruled. It is difficult also to call all the rulers Hindu rulers. Anyway, uh, quote-unquote Hindu rulers. And um, medieval India was also identified uh, with the time, with the period, when Muslim rulers were in control over the major portion of the country. And modern India was identified with the establishment of British colonial rule. Not with any religion, but with the establishment of British colonial rule. Now, this periodization was in vogue for a long period of time, unless uh, this was challenged. And the challenge came mostly from scholars who were influenced by uh, Marxist ideology, Marxism. And they said that it should be done on the basis of the socio-economic system, on the basis of the mode of production. 
And so they said, uh, these new scholars are good, that ancient India should be identified with a slave mode of production. Uh, medieval India should be identified with a feudal mode of production. And modern India should be identified with a capitalist mode of production. But such a periodization could be applicable to the European situation, no doubt. It was applicable. But when one uh, applies it to the Indian situation, some problems crop up. As for example, uh, if we talk about the beginning of uh, feudalism, then beginning of feudalism can be traced back to the late Gupta period, 4th century, 5th century AD, roughly. And then we have uh, the emergence of feudal forces, and at one point of time, after many decades, uh, there was the feudal mode of production also. And so medieval India came to be identified with the feudal mode of production. But what about uh, the ancient India? Now ancient India is uh, originally identified with the slave mode of production. But uh, there is a problem when we deal with the Indian situation. Now, there is no doubt that uh, in ancient India, we will find slaves. Slave labor was there. Uh, many ruling dynasties, rulers, and people, they employed slaves. But the existence of slaves is one thing. And the existence of the slave mode of production as the dominant mode of production is another thing. And in fact, there is no comprehensive work till now uh, about uh, whether there was a slave mode of production as the dominant mode in ancient India. There are some works, no doubt. Uh, one can refer to uh, the work by uh, Chanana, Slavery in Ancient India, Aris Sharma's book on Shudros, or uh, Uma Chakraborty's book, Beyond the Brahmins, uh, Kings and the Brahmins, very important books. But uh, none of these books, they, of course, they, all of them uh, throw light on the, on the existence of slaves, common people, marginal people. But uh, there is no, con we, we cannot come to any definite conclusion about this particular thing, that is whether the slave mode of production was the dominant mode in ancient India. So there is a problem here. Anyway, uh, for argument's sake, let us say that there was something like slavery, etc., even if it was not a dominant one. But that brings us to the modern period. Now, here also we are faced with a problem. Because modern India, what we understand by modern India is ident very much identified with the advent of colonial rule, establishment of colonial rule. Now, colonial rule meaning British colonial rule, but because that was the dominant power, though there were other small colonies in some pockets. Other European powers were also there. Anyway, India was a British colony. And the capitalist system, or the system of industrial capitalism, which developed in India, was in fact a transplantation of the Western capitalist system on the Indian soil. So capitalism in India was not the product of the normal evolution of the Indian society. It was an exportation from outside. That is one fundamental difference. The second point is that uh, unlike Britain, which was an independent country. India was subjugated by Britain. And so development of industrial capitalism in India uh, cannot be a full, free, full-blooded development. It cannot be an independent development because the Indian economy only catered to the needs of Britain. We know that Britain transformed Indian economy into raw materials supplying appendage to her, to Britain. And the third important point is that, unlike Britain, where capitalism emerged 
uh, out on the on the ruins of feudalism. One can refer to the Wars of the Roses, the coming of the new monarchy, then the dissolution of the monastic lands, coming of the gentry, etc. So, uh, and the civil war, of course, uh, mid 17th century civil war. In India, there was an adjustment with feudalism. The land set, three land settlements introduced by the British. This, this created a new class of landowners, not a class of the bourgeoisie, but a new class of landowners. So unlike Britain, there was an adjustment between feudalism and capitalism. So modern, the concept of modernity or modern India, uh, in the conventional sense of the term, we, we cannot apply it, apply it in the case of India, simply because the history of Britain uh, was to basically different from the history as it had developed in our country. That brings us to the third part, that is uh, terminologies. Now, it is generally accepted that the uh, intellectual history of India in the 19th and 20th centuries was a history of the struggle between the forces of progress and the forces of reaction. But in the, con but in the context of India, which is a which was a colony, who represented the forces of progress and who represented the forces of reaction? That is a problem. And in fact, there is no unanimity on this question. No clear unanimity. Now, one view is that progress was represented uh, by those who stood for modernity. And when this school or this group of people spoke about modernity, what they had in their mind is Western type of modernity. The modernity which they inherited from, from the West, primarily from Britain, that is who fought against uh, obscure and dis obscurantist beliefs, feudal beliefs or pre-feudal beliefs that existed in, in our country. Uh, who championed the cause of rationality, uh, science, enlightenment against scripture, etc. This was uh, one kind of uh, one kind of opinion. That is, here progress or modernity was associated with what we inherited, what we got from Britain, from the Western world. And in fact, one can refer uh, to uh, Bunkim Chandra Chattopadhyay in this connection. Bunkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, the celebrated literator, was very much influenced by positivist sociology as well as utilitarian political economy. And he identified the cause of India's poverty and subjugation in the absence of those cultural attributes which had made Europe more equipped in the cultural sphere. According to him, the major part of India's religious beliefs was based on vairagya or renunciation and niyoti or fatalism, concepts he considered totally unsuitable for the modern world. So, in his opinion, if India were to progress, she should give up her archaic beliefs and outmoded social institutions. He also believed that as the British had laid the material conditions for these changes, so Indians must remain under their tutelage in order to learn more from them. By holding such a view, Bunkim Chandro was clearly arguing in favour of a continuation of the colonial rule. Now, on the other hand, progress was also uh, represented by those who uh, took up the cause of the Indians against the exploitative nature of British rule. There were many intellectuals in the second half of the 19th century, like uh, Nadavai Nauroji, uh, M.G. Ranade, uh, who talked about the drainage of wealth. And they believed that the drainage of wealth, the extraction of the maximum revenue, these were the main causes of the poverty of India. So there was a critic of colonial rule, from at least from that point of time. This was another view. Now there was a there was another view about modernity that was which was identified with Bengal Renaissance. It was believed that 
Bengal Renaissance could be compared to the European Renaissance, European Reformation. And since Renaissance and Reformation in Europe were uh, very much the manifestations, cultural manifestations uh, of broad socioeconomic changes, that is, uh, which brought about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And these scholars argued that uh, in the case of the Bengal Renaissance, Bengal Renaissance intellectuals, they were the products of the progressive bourgeois. That was also another view. Shushabhan Chandra Sarkar, in his uh, notes on the Bengal Renaissance, he compared Bengal's role in the modern, modern awakening of India uh, to the position occupied by Italy in the story of the Europe, European Renaissance. And he said that Ramon Roy's criticism of priest craft and superstition reminded him of the leaders of the Protestant uh, revolution in Europe. Now, these were some of the ideas about modernity. All these were ideas about modernity. Now, these formulations had been challenged in the 1970s following the Noxalite iconoclasm, image breaking. And it was argued by these new scholars that there might have been some modern elements among the 19th century scholars. But there is also, there is also another side of British rule. There is a negative side, the destructive side. Deindustrialization, poverty of India, drainage of wealth, uh, destruction of deindustrial indigenous destruction of indigenous industries, and the pressure on land, new land owning class, peasant resistance, and uh, the creation of an elite class which was totally isolated from the masses. And what the need of the hour was to get rid of colonial rule and to become free and independent. But these intellectuals did not do such things. So uh, they, uh, on the other hand, they had identified themselves with colonial rule. And so uh, their sense of modernity was totally identified with colonial rule. So, and, uh, but, but uh, modernity demands that they should go against the British be more national in their outlook, but that they did not do these things. Now, Shumit Sharkar also criticized uh, Ram Mohan Roy's break with tradition as deeply contradictory. In fact, there was a contradiction between what Ram Mohan Roy uh, actually preached and what he implemented in practice. There was always a difference, uh, like uh, the sacred thread he adorned his neck throughout his, throughout his life, or uh, he did not sit at the same table with people belonging to the lower caste. Uh, he was against idolatry, but his disciples, they uh, performed Durga Puja festivals. So these things are there. So these contradictions are there, which, were, which have been pointed out uh, by critics uh, who dealt with the questions of modernity. So I stop here and seek your questions. Sir, I have one question. Regarding the uh, that part of the topic, where you said they were the, that India had to adjust to some extent uh, in order to accept the capitalism, as it was not a full-blooded capitalism, or a ra or rather a natural product of India, and it was imposed rather by the British, who had a totally different historical context. These adjustments. How far did they extend in this, I mean, society? Were they only limited to the political part or the um, economic part or on, they only had social impacts? Yes, they, they, there was an adjustment because uh, since, the situ since the condition in Britain and the condition in India was different, so industrial capitalism, which was, which was not the product of the natural evolution of Indian society. So in order to achieve modernity, one has to do away with feudalism, no doubt about it. Britain did it, but India did not do it. India could have done it had there been no British rule. 
had there been no colonial rule, that could have been achieved because the potentialities of capitalist development in India were there. There are many scholars who wrote about it. So it was a, it was a, uh, not a full-blooded development, but a uh, half-hearted development or uh, not a development at all in that sense. So I have one question. You were talking that uh, you were telling just now that in ancient India there was the prevalence um, of the slavery of the system of slavery. There was existence of slavery. Slavery was pre prevalent over there, but it does not imply that the existence of slavery means that there was also the existence of a slave mode of production. So, so what exactly is the slave mode of production? Uh, Slave mode of production is that mode of production when uh, the major part of the production process is totally dependent on slave labor. That is, slave labor formed the most important part of productive labor. Mm. What we, uh, yes, Shudros were acted as slaves. When Arish Sharma talked about Shudros, mm. they were slaves and uh, war prisoners. Dashas, they were slaves, but uh, there were also peasants. Peasants were not slaves. Koshokos were there, they were not slaves. But uh, so, sla existence of slaves is one thing, and the, so, and the existence of slave mode of production as a dominant mode is, an, uh, as, is another thing. So, we do not know whether the slave mode of production was the dominant mode. Like the plantation workers, mostly. Yes, they, they, yeah, they, the slaves also till the soil. They were mm. also employed. They were household slaves. They were tillers of the soil. But mm. apart from them, there are also free peasants, free peasants who till the soil. So we are not very definite. Okay. There is no comprehensive work. That is what mm. I am suggesting. The history of modern India begins from the late 18th century when European powers started colonizing parts of our country. The 19th and 20th centuries witnessed first consolidation and then disintegration of colonial rule. These are also marked by the spread of Western education, science, technology and culture. Another feature of this period was the integration of India in the international capitalist economic order. The concept of modern India has to be understood with reference to those of ancient India and medieval India. For some historians, ancient India is a period of Hindu rulers and medieval India the period of Muslim rulers. Modern India for them is synonymous with British rule, signifying a period of Christian domination. Marxist historians categorize ancient period as one when the slave mode of production prevailed, medieval period as one when feudalism prevailed and modern period as one when capitalism made its presence felt. While identifying periods by religion of rulers is unscientific, identifying them by systems of production is also problematic because of the Eurocentric nature of various concepts and terminologies. History of modern India is believed to have witnessed intense struggle between the forces of progress and those of reaction. But question is, who stood for progress and who stood for reaction? Many Indians thought that the British had laid the material foundation for India's march beyond the medieval era. So they were in favour of colonial rule, taking it as a catalyst of progress. However, many people argued that British colonial rule was in fact one of the root causes of India's growing impoverishment. So there was a reactionary element in the colonial rule. While the British introduced the concept of modernity to India, Indians' response to it was complex. People with vision made a forceful bid for modernity but gradually it created a social divide between western educated urban elite and the common people and even the practice of modernity by the elite was fraught with contradictions 